Hi, good afternoon. I'm John Sawyer. I'm the director of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and it's a great pleasure for us to uh, be here today and to be part of the DC Environmental Film Festival, uh, and to have the opportunity to share excerpts and trailers from the extraordinary films you'll see this afternoon. The subject is water, from pollution on our own Potomac River uh, to the disappearance of, of islands in the South Pacific. Uh, from innovative attempts at uh, adaptation to climate change in Bangladesh uh, to the drought-fueled conflicts in southern Ethiopia and, and new techniques aimed at bringing uh, clean water and sanitation to uh, villages in Ethiopia also and, and in the process easing the burden uh, of water for women and girls and, and giving them the opportunity for more productive lives. We've got a lot of ground to cover this afternoon with these excerpts, and, and we also want to leave time for a brief panel discussion uh, after the screening and for informal conversation at, at a reception which will be just across the hall uh, after, the, after the panel, and we hope that you'll stay and join us for that. Uh, I'll ask the videographers and other panelists uh, to join me on the stage as soon as we complete the films. The water issues covered today are really uh, exactly the sort that have been the focus of the Pulitzer Center's work, covering big systemic issues that have gone underreported and bringing them to audiences like you. The excerpts and trailers we're viewing today were produced in partnership with the Pulitzer Center, with the exception of the first, excerpts from Hedrick Smith's two-hour special for PBS Frontline on Poison Waters a masterful and troubling look at what is happening to two of our country's most treasured waterways, the Chesapeake and the uh, Puget Sound. So with that, um, we'll, let's see, we'll see the films. We're going to see them straight through. It's about 45 minutes or so long, and then after that, if the panelists could all come join me on the stage, we'll have the discussion. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Uh, the, I think if all the panelists could come up now, um, we'll get started. We have about 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes for uh, discussion and questions, and uh, we welcome your questions. I have some of my own, and if you do have a question, if you could go to the mics on, the, on either side and just, and just uh, gather there and so we can I mean, move as briskly as we can and take advantage of the time. You've got the bios of, of the panelists, and so in the interest of time, I'll dispense with those. In addition to Rick Smith, Rick Smith is second from the right here, you saw in the piece. Uh, we're joined by Jen Redfern, who's in the middle, who produced Sun Come Up, and Glenn Baker, director of Easy Like Water, beyond Jen. Uh, Steve Sapienza, the producer of Easy Like Water, is also here, he's back in the back filming uh, this today. Uh, and we also, I'm sorry, I wish that Fred and Sam Lazaro of NewsHour could be here, but he's on assignment this week in Cambodia. On the stage, we also have David Douglas at the far left, uh, the president of Water Advocates, and Amy Frankel on my side, the North American representative for the United Nations Environmental Program. In the few minutes we have, uh, I'd like to uh, focus on, on any questions you have, but for myself, I'd like to start with just what I consider two crucial subjects. I mean, we're here as part of the Environmental Film Festival looking at video. So I think the importance, to me, a question, the importance of video in telling these stories and how to get work like this done and aired uh, at a time when the traditional news media model has all but collapsed. The news, the news media model that many of us grew up with who've been in it for a number of years. And on that, uh, I think I'd like to begin with Rick Smith an early pioneer and, and great success in, in making the shift from print uh, to video. I mean, could you have told the poison water story, Rick, in the New York Times with the same kind of impact? I, the answer is no. Um, you, the particular things we're looking at, you, I mean, you get intrigued with watching the scientists cut up the fish, you start to get into the microscope, it's a very difficult place to take people. You begin to actually see something going on in the organism of the fish, and then that makes it credible that that could happen uh, you know, in people's bodies. And you start, otherwise, it's, it's a bunch of talking heads. Um, we went underwater to show underwater pollution. We showed dead zones 
not in this segment, but uh, to talk about a dead zone as looking like the face of the moon is one thing, but to see lush grass underwater where fish and crabs and clams and oysters and so forth can grow and where you have wildlife uh, multiplying and marine life thriving and then looking at something which is absolutely unbelievably naked is vivid. And if you understand that dead zones are doubling worldwide every decade because a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico the size of in the Gulf of Mexico the size of the state of Massachusetts, once you've seen this dead area, you see the dead crabs and the dead fish at the bottom of it, you have, it has a very different impact. So I, I don't think there's any question that video uh, has an impact it's graphic, media, compelling, uh, and vivid in a way that, that all but the very finest print writers or novelists are projected. Question, a question over on the side. Yes, thank you so much uh, for the films. I have two questions. One is living here in D.C., drinking the water from the tap. I am very concerned. I mean, I had heard there are definitely other things in the water that are not being filtered out, but are there ways that we can purify the water at least more than just using maybe a Brita filter or a pure filter? I don't think they're probably that effective. Um, but So I'd like to hear more about water purification from any of the... I know that's not what all the films dealt with, but it's definitely an issue of concern. And the second question is regarding the... A uh, film about Bangladesh. Did he get the <laughs> the money, the prize, and also what are some of the um, ways that he's working with international organizations to fund some of the projects he has? Um, and the last one, actually, three questions is: Are there efforts to kind of bring together the examples, uh, positive examples from different regions of the world? to share best practices around water use, whether it's purification or other things that we can learn from what different communities are doing worldwide. Thank you. Let me try this again, but let me be quick so others can talk. Um, our immediate response to seeing something like this, that is the poison water, is what can I do to purify my water? The answer is we can only do something collectively. The standards have got to be raised sharply. The EPA's got to do something. People have got to protest. Congress has got to pass new legislation. This is not something you can solve individually. I mean, that's part of what we need to recognize. Part of our problem is, in my opinion, in this country, is in the last 30 years, we've sort of drifted away from the original thrust of energy and outrage and urgency of environmental cleanup that was reflected in the Clean Water Act and the EPA. We sort of figured, well, everybody can take care of it themselves. No, you can't. This has got to be a collective endeavor. There's got to be enough money to fund the science, to keep up with the endocrine disruptors. There's got to be more regulation that takes place. Yes, you can fight it in your local community, but only when the major national effort is made. And let me just stop there and let others talk, because I think it was not. I hope you have better luck with your hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is this working? Yeah. Okay. We always say in video, though, the sound is the big problem. Uh, the, the question on about easy like water, which, by the way, I guess if I had to pitch it in Hollywood, it would be uh, Waterworld meets my architect. But, um, the the uh, answer about at the World Bank Development Marketplace, there are 100 contestants, um, of which 25 were awarded prize money uh, up to $200,000. Uh, there were five contestants there from Bangladesh. None of them got anything. Um, so it was kind of striking to us that what is really a frontline state, a frontline state in climate change that's being affected, you know, as we speak, hundreds of thousands of refugees already flooding to Dhaka and other parts of the, the country, and pressing up against the borders, uh, that n no funding went to them. But but he has been relatively successful over the years in getting support. Uh, his uh, internet connectivity on the uh, school boats um, was through a, a grant from the Gates Foundation. And uh, he, he's also gotten some tech awards and Ashton Trust. And he makes it part of his mission to go around the world and you know, sell his project. 
And that's part of what we, we're portraying in the film, which is not finished. We're in mid-production now. Um, we aim to get back there this summer during flood season and uh, continue to follow the story, uh, both his story and the story of the community. David, on the, on the best practices question, this is something that, that I think Water Advocates has done a lot of work on trying to raise the visibility of things that are succeeding around the world. You maybe want to tackle that? Uh, actually, not so much focused on best practices, but on increasing funding for international drinking water and sanitation. Uh, the, the shortfall in funding has been so critical. Uh, and just in this country, I think the, the, the number is $20 billion is a shortfall in our own country that we're not paying each year to keep up with basic infrastructure of water and sewage. We don't spend enough in our country to, to, to get clean water, adequate sanitation, and that's a worldwide problem. In terms of best practices, um, that's a number of, of international institutions are involved with that. The United States government took a major leap forward yesterday uh, by a speech from the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton at the National Geographic. If you've gotten your National Geographic this year or this week, it's focused, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, right up here. Right up there. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, one of the few times the Geographic has voted or devoted an entire issue uh, just to uh, just to one uh, uh, in addition to just one particular issue, it's uh, and and uh, Hillary Clinton uh, was there yesterday morning to say the U.S. government will become is intending to become a leader in helping to try to get clean, affordable, safe water uh, to the poor. And as part of that, the State Department I think will be uh, becoming a higher uh, or an increased leader in uh, trying to collect the best practices and publicize that along with a number of the foundations like the Gates Foundation. Right. Amy? Do you want to add that? Do you want to add any thought on that? Oh, uh, is this working? Yes. Yes, all right. Yes. I got lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also want to address uh, from the perspective of the United Nations Environment Program, because uh, we do a lot of work on best practices. And uh, first of all, uh, some of you might not know that yesterday was World Water Day. Uh, so the timing of these films is, uh, is very much uh, t very timely to, uh, to bring these issues to bear uh, through the festival. So I'm very grateful for, th uh, for this opportunity. And what the, the theme of, the, uh, of World Water Day this year is, a c is clean water for a healthy world. So it's not just about quantity, but it's also about quality. And that's a very important point that is brought out by these films. The issue is not, and, and the issue is also very complex. So while we also absolutely need money uh, and to be getting access in communities to drinking water, we also have to look at uh, making sure that the water is, is clean and healthy and helping people to be able to do that themselves. Uh, so if you look in this country, for example, the cause of the U.S. waters not meeting the Clean Water Act standards, a lot of it has been attributed by EPA itself, attributed to uh, runoff to the non-point source pollution, for example, from agriculture and other sources like that that are very, very widespread and hard to control, which, by the way, is the responsibility of states, not the federal government. So it's a complex regulatory scheme. If you look overseas, you know, you've got ag runoff, if you, if you have toxic waste disposal issues, if you've got land-based sources of marine pollution, all of these things uh, come back uh, and, and have to be looked at as, as an integrated way. So some of the things we're doing, first, uh, there's a meeting in Nairobi uh, this week uh, that I actually helped to organize, that's where our headquarters uh, is located, to look at the water quality issue. How can we build more capacity around the world, especially in the developing world, uh, to, to be able to test for these issues and to communicate that so that we are not uh, inadvertently contributing, you know, to the problem by digging out water that's then not safe. Um, and also, secondly, looking at things in an integrated way. Uh, there's a lot we're doing, for example, on greening the economy and trying to reduce the very inputs into the agriculture system, which saves people money, uh, putting a value on the environment so that we have a more sustainable practice and avoid the problems in the first place. So we're getting backed up with questions, so let's try one over here. But we'll try to have short questions and short answers until we get as many as possible in the time we have. So one over here. This is just a comment about the best practices on water. Uh, I'm with a company in town called Flying Colors Broadcast. We launched a Katrina information channel following Katrina that broadcasts recovery. 
uh, directly into shelters. We regrouped and formed a nonprofit. It has 12 topic blocks. It'll be launched in third quarter. One of the topic blocks is water, and we're looking for ideas from all over the world on resources and purification. And the website's 21tv.com, 20 written out, the number one TV. Dot org, sorry, dot org and also dot com. But we do plan to do best practices from around the world. It'll be on satellite and uh, the internet. 21 TV. 21, dot org. 20 written out, the number mm -hmm. one TV dot dot org. org. Okay. There is a website up now. We won't be launching till third quarter. We are actively looking for information on 12 different information blocks, mm -hmm. and one of the most important ones is water. Good. Actually, that gives me a chance to make a plug for this downstream site. You should go and do a share your stories video on your webcam and put it up here. If you see World Water Day in the middle here, yesterday we did about 30 or 35 of these short video sound bites of people attending the, the National Geographic event that David mentioned, experts and individuals and students, and it's all mapped on, on, on Google Maps, and, and it's a conversation that we hope to, it is a global conversation. If you look at the map on the site, you'll see comments coming from all over, and it's a chance to, to let people know about things like 21tv.org and other initiatives that are taking place. A question over here? Yes, hi there, good afternoon. My name's Todd C. Wiggins, and I blog like probably most of the people in this room. Uh, my pseudonym is called Urban Revival Media. I have a quick question. First of all, have you seen the site, uh, it's called Mpivot, E-M-P-I-V-O-T, which I believe is based out of D.C., and it's all environmental videos. It works in the, similar to YouTube that you can upload any type of environmental video for free, and I think it really addresses a lot of the interests uh, that you have as far as making videos and distributing them. Second question is about desalinization versus what's called air to water, taking water out of the moisture in the air. Uh, as opposed to digging, you know, bringing water in from uh, saltwater lakes, et cetera. Which works better, if at all, and what have you seen more prevalent in uh, Africa and the places that you visited? Anybody want to tackle? Amy? <laughs> oh, on the question of sort of how do you get the work out, I wanted to come back to Jen Radford because, I mean, Jen, Jen's film, The Sun Come Up, uh, was first parts, uh, a version of that was first shown, aired on, on the PBS program Foreign Exchange, uh, which is now off the air, and a, and a piece that, that, that one version of Easy Like Water aired on WNET's World Focus, which was another short-lived effort to have an international program uh, that WNET Channel 13 in New York started last year, and they just announced that they're going off the air for lack of funding next month. We still have Frontline, which is a, a great platform for Rick, we work with them on projects. We have NewsHour, which is a fabulous platform. But it's harder to find places. It's harder to find funds. And yet, I mean, Jen has won festival awards with Sun Comes Up, and she's uh, proceeding with a feature-length documentary. So perhaps you can tell your story uh, from, from a videographer's point of view. Sure. Uh, so we started with the shorter version, which um, aired on, as, as John said, which aired on Foreign Exchange. And then um, we tweaked, out, tweaked that a little bit more and submitted that to the Media That Matters Film Festival and ended up winning the jury award for that. And through that, then gained a lot of support and recognition um, for the project. And, and after that, we were able to raise um, additional funds through the New York State Council of the Arts, through Chicken and Egg Pictures, um, through online fundraising. We've been sort of reaching out through a variety of sources and through that have been able to create a longer version, which is a 40 minute version, um, which will air, uh, which will premiere at the Full Frame Festival on April 8th. And, um, and then we'll do a festival run with, with that version, um, community screenings, and then pitch it to broadcasters around the world. So we're, we're, we're working on getting the story out through, in various lengths and through various mediums. I, I don't, I'm very curious about the desalination versus air to water, but I'm, unfortunately I, I don't know how to answer that question. Question over here? 